Good morning. Um, I'll start with an overview of cyanohabs in California, and then I'll be um, talking about what's been going on for the last three years in swamps and developing a program and what we plan to do for the next three years. And um, I hope that will help you understand how the satellite imagery and what you're going to be learning over the two, next two days fits into the larger program. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm going to concentrate on four areas, the Klamath River, Clear Lake, San Francisco Bay Area and Delta, and Monterey Bay, Pinto Lake Area, but I'll also be presenting some data from Southern California. The Klamath River Basin is a very large watershed, 12,000 square miles. The river is 250 miles long. It's multi-jurisdictional and spans two states, Oregon and California, there are six tribes that live along the tributaries and main stem of the Klamath River. In 2007, they had a river-wide bloom. The bloom extend, extended from the um, reservoirs down to the mouth of the river. That's 200 miles. In 2012, they had another river-wide bloom, and they have had one every summer since then, um, in 2013 and 2014. As I said, there are six tribes that live on the Klamath River, and um, they're very involved in the program, uh, the Cyanohab program. Um, there's a cultural beneficial use up in the Klamath River, so this is an environmental justice issue. And the tribes um, use the river for ceremonies, cultural ceremonies to tie them to the land and are intrinsic to their identity. So they're very involved in this process, um, setting up the program, and it's a very high value for them that we're, we need to protect. The Klamath River Basin Monitoring Program is the most developed regional program for cyanohabs in the state. They have uh, monitoring coordination, uh, common analytical methods and sampling protocols, data management, a watershed stewardship assessment reports, as well as a web information portal, the Blue Green Algae Tracker. And here you can see all the local, state, and federal agency tribes, as well as Pacific Corps that's involved in this. Can I interrupt you? Yes. Can folks who are in the audience raise their hand if they're interested in joining the Klamath River Basin? Thank you. Um, this is a. a Picture of the blue green tracker. This is how they keep track of their monitoring data. Okay, now I'll go on to Clear Lake. Yeah, okay. Clear Lake um, is a large lake in Lake County. Um, it, many people think it's the oldest lake in the United States. It has 15 drinking water intakes around the lake. So one of the most sensitive um, beneficial uses to protect is drinking water. Um, there's 15 intakes around the lake, and you can see in with these red uh, triangles, and 17 water treatment plants. One of them is for a dialysis treatment plant. So it's very important in Clear Lake that um, we are able to control toxin levels and able to treat um, the water when there are blooms. Here you can see. Okay, this, this screen. Here you can see a bloom uh, where the arrow is and the water intake. It seems like uh, Clear Lake have had the succession of blooms of various species from the spring that lasts throughout the summer, and then one of those species dominates as the major bloom of the year. Uh, Clear Lake has been working with Blue Water Satellite. There are another, uh, there are a company that uh, works with algorithms to predict um, phycocyanin levels as well as phosphorus levels. They use Landsat satellites, and Rick might talk about that. The downside is that this is kind of an indirect method of, of measuring these. So um, people from Clear Lake, I know that there's at least one person, can compare these methods and discuss them in the, in the next two days. Okay. Yeah. Now, 
Delta. Um, in 1999, microcystin blooms were found in the Delta, and almost every year since then, we've, we've found blooms. This, um, if you're not familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area, this is the San Francisco Bay, Sassoon Marsh, and Sassoon Bay, and then this is the Delta. And later I'll be talking to you about the East Bay Parks right here. The USGS, uh, together with the Regional Monitoring Program, has a water sampling program that goes from the South Bay all the way up to the Sacramento River. And through this program, uh, Rafe Cadella has been measuring microcystins micro as well as demolic acid using a spat, which is a resin where the water flows through and the spat binds the toxin. So we can detect toxins in the various segments of the bay. This is color coded. So you can see that we um, have identified microcystins in all the segments of the bay, but um, higher concentrations higher up in the bay, more near the freshwater delta, and at higher concentrations. Now we'll go to the East Bay Park. Um, East Bay Parks are on the east side of San Francisco Bay. So here's San Francisco Bay, and up here the delta. There's 65 parks that make up East Bay Regional Park District. And in the parks, there is a series of lakes. Um, although they've had blooms in these lakes for many years, it wasn't until last summer, 2014, in Lake Temescal that they had a toxic event. Um, that caused that lake to be closed that summer. And this is a, one of the most used lakes for swimming in the East Bay. Since then, in the last six months, they've had blooms in um, all of these lakes that have these orange stars. Uh, Shadow Cliffs Lake, um, they just detected microcystis, but in all these other lakes, they have large-scale blooms, particularly in Lake Chabot. Here. Right here, they had a very large-scale bloom. Um, up to 150,000 micrograms per liter, and three associated dog deaths. Yeah. Actually, I'm sorry, it's not. It's there. Oh, okay. The emergency light for the room. Got it. Okay. Now we'll go on to Monterey Bay and Pinto Lake. Um, the yellow dots are um, areas where sea otters were found. Um, by Melissa Miller. She had this project to identify the cause of sea otter deaths um, in Monterey Bay. So all those little yellow dots were where um, sea otters, dead sea otters were found. They conducted an investigation and autopsies on the sea otters to determine what the cause of death was. And they found that microcystin in sea otter tissues was linked to bivalve consumption liver damage and jaundice, and you can see here the jaundice in the roof of the mouth and other tissues in the sea otters. So they conducted an investigation and found that microcystis blooms in Pinto Lake. Pinto Lake is a lake where they've been having really large-scale blooms for quite a few years, and it was coming, these blooms, um, the microcystis and microcystins were coming down the Pajaro River getting in the bivalves, and the otters were eating these bivalves, and they're really voracious eaters, and um, killing the, the sea otters. So for several years, um, they took track of um, how many sea otters died uh, from microcystins, and they found that um, these cases were increasing through time. Um, they also, Melissa Miller has been very instrumental, and she's a vet that works for um, California Fish and Wildlife, and um, keeping track of animal deaths um, from microcystins and cyanohabs. So um, this is a graph for sea otters, dogs, cattle, horses, fish, birds, and goats, and it seems as if those, the number of deaths are increasing. And on the bottom, you can see um, sea otter deaths, and you can see that it's really not that seasonal, but it seems to be a peak in June, but it can occur during the winter.
at you also. Um, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project developed, uh, gathered some data from various organizations. The data was collected from um, UC Santa Cruz and these groups here. And this was conducted opportunistically from projects that were, had many different study designs. But they found that of all the uh, data that they collected, that microsystems were detected in more than half of the sites. They were detected in a variety of water bodies, including wetlands, lagoons, lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, estuaries, and marine water. And they were also detected across a wide variety of land use types. So now I'll go through um, the projects that we've put together in the last three years, as well as what we plan for the next three years. Because of this data, these blooms that are occurring around the state and the, the risk associated with it for drinking water and animals and, and recreational activities as well as cultural activities. Um, we started to, in 2011 to put together some projects on cyanohabs. The first one we put together was a two-day cyanotoxin workshop in November 2012, and we invited experts from around the country to attend this workshop. Um, the, the first day of the workshop was informational, where they uh, provided information on their research and their experience in working with cyanohabs. And then the next day was uh, putting together a workshop, kind of a brainstorming workshop on how best to design a monitoring program. We've also um, contracted with SQUIRT, Southern California Coastal Research Project, to compile additional cyanotoxin data from what you saw on that last slide. We have two contracts with NOAA. The first one was in 2013-14 to conduct satellite ground truthing. So um, those four areas, the Klamath, Clear Lake, Shadow uh, Lake, the Delta, and Lake Elsinore in Southern California, we, we gathered data from those lakes and tried to ground truth them satellite images that Rick provided. And um, I think he'll probably have some slides with that. And then um, we also have another contract with NOAA, which is part of this training. Um, and then also they'll be developing, or they have developed a list of water bodies uh, where these, um, where the satellite images can resolve um, cyanobacteria blooms, as well as they're going to be developing this with a time series of blooms um, or conditions in various water bodies for our status and trends report. Um, cyanotoxins were added to regional and statewide swamp monitoring programs. Each region, there's nine regions in the state that have regional swamp monitoring programs, as well as there's three statewide monitoring programs. And um, cyanotoxins were added to quite a few of those programs so that we can gather data around the state. Um, We've also contracted with um, Marina Power at SQUIRT to develop a freshwater HABS monitoring assessment and reporting strategy, and that's due in August or September of this year. So this um, monitoring assessment and reporting strategy is still in draft, but our goal is to develop a coordinated and widely supported statewide strategy for monitoring assessment and reporting to inform management decisions for freshwater HAB. Our objectives are to design a scientifically sound statewide program, identify a scientific framework and resources, and provide a strategic roadmap of technical resources, infrastructure, and funding. In order to support this strategy, there are several elements that are needed. Quality assurance, the development of SOPs, training programs, guidance, documentation, and data management and visualization. So what we've done um, in the past really nine months is develop some products to support a larger program. And I'll go through these projects in more detail right now. So for um, the next three years, um, we have developed contracts for various products, and I'll list them here and then go into more detail in a minute. Uh, the first one is a guidance document for field and lab work. 
Um, the second one is to park some swamp resources at the California Water Pollution Control Lab, it's the California Fish and Wildlife Department Lab, where they analyze um, uh, cyanotoxins. Um, we've contracted with SFEI to do satellite imagery processing and near real-time notification. So how this will work, will, with SFEI will get the satellite images, download the satellite images, and then we'll have a network of contacts for lake managers or any people who are responsible for lakes. They'll notify these people once they identify that a bloom is starting at a lake, and then that will, um, those lake managers can go out and um, monitor the lake. Um, now, you're all here for this workshop, and I think it will be really beneficial for you to get this information so that you can download your own images, and that can direct your monitoring of the lake once you start that monitoring. SSEI will also develop databases and a website, a newsletter bulletin, and write a status and trend summary report. We'll also have trainings, this NOAA training, and um, another training that I'll talk about through the Training Academy. Okay, the guidance document will have two sections, the field section and the laboratory section. Um, the field section will be a compilation or development of SOPs for sampling, cyanotoxins, and a variety of types of water bodies, um, as well as health and safety recommendations. Uh, there will be a second section, a laboratory section, which will compile SOPs for ELISA and LCMSMS analysis from the five major labs in California that conduct these analysis. analyses. Um, we'll also develop a performance-based QA system for cyanotoxins and develop a decision tree framework for analyzing cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins for event response sampling. And this is also due um, next spring. A lot, of these a lot of these products are due next spring, so we're going to be having these trainings um, next spring in order to introduce everyone to these documents. Um, as I said, we'll be um, putting some funds aside at uh, WPCL uh, for cyanotoxin analysis for people to um, use in these various projects. I know the EPA lab has been very generous in analyzing cyanotoxins for various lakes um, in, the, in the state also. Um, SFBI will download the satellite imagery, and as I said, notify the lake managers. They'll retrieve and process the imagery, notify contacts, contacts when imagery indicates a bloom in near real time, and respond to requests for follow-up information. They'll also be putting out a newsletter or a bulletin bi-weekly during bloom season and monthly in the winter, which includes an inland HAB status report process satellite imagery for the state with chlorophyll A and phycocyanin indices, bloom and toxicity updates, and reports of human or animal illnesses or death. This is an example of a health bulletin that Florida puts out, and um, we're looking at that for a possible model. SFEI will also be developing two databases. Uh, cyanotoxin and cyanobacteria species information uh, database using seed and templates, as well as a web-based form for entry of bloom information. We'll also have a website. Um, the um, California Water Quality Monitoring Council has asked the CCHAP work group, which ha used to be the, blue the statewide blueberry algae work group, to be a work group of the council. And what that means is that basically they're responsible for a portal, and the California Water Quality Monitoring Council has a series of portals. And this will be one of their web-based portals that will display um, the satellite images with indices, the lab data that people will put in, um, not only from all the different labs, but that people are collecting for the various lakes after they're notified of these blooms. Uh, bloom information from the Bloom database, incident reports of illnesses or deaths, and the newsletter bulletin. 
SFEI is also going to be developing a status and trends report of cyanohabs in California using historic satellite imagery that NOAA will be providing as well as laboratory data. Okay, trainings. Um, no, we're really, this is the first training we've had, this NOAA training. Um, and we'll be having a second training this spring, uh, well, this July. It's a one-day training, and um, it'll be in four locations, in Humboldt, at UC Davis, uh, Santa, UC Santa Cruz, and probably um, uh, the uh, University of San Marcos. Uh, State University of San Marcos. And um, this will be a one-day one day training on background with reference materials on cyanohab, field sampling protocols, health and safety while sampling, taxonomy training in the laboratory with microscopes so the people who manage lakes can identify a species. Then if you can identify a species, you can know what types of toxins to look for and an overview of management options. I think that's really sorely needed. We've been having, particularly East Bay Parks, call us and say, okay, now what do we do? And I really feel like we need a more sharing of information on what to do about these HAPs. It's important to get this information really early, and I think when we identify these blooms by satellite and we can see them in their infancy, then we can have more hope of really trying to uh, mitigate these blooms. In spring uh, 2016, we'll have a lot of the swamp documents by then because they'll be final next spring. So we're going to add a second day to the training and we'll have a two-day training at those same locations next spring. They'll include the topics in the one-day training as well as um, information on the swamp cyanohab program and guidance documents, field and laboratory analysis for, for cyanotoxins, the tiered approach to sampling and analysis, Use of the website, um, hopefully the website will be up by then, and the database, how to input data to this database so that it will display it on the web, and how to report them. Um, any questions? 